Uh, yeah. Right then, good. Still afternoon, fortunately. <laughs> so my name's uh, Daniel Thompson. I'm speaking to you. Well, I've got an enviable task, in some unenviable task, in the sense that I'm going to try and explain why a fairly complex branch of statistics is really exciting and can be tackled by amateurs. Um, so I've got my comrade uh, Summit on the screen here. He is the guy who did most of the actual typing. Um, I was supervising the work, but I live in Bristol, which is where I get to stand and talk to you today. Um, so I've given this a slightly idiosyncratic name. That's gone too far ahead, isn't it? I've lost a slide, that's why. I've lost a slide. There was a slide saying you know, why and what the characters are in this particular performance. So I'm going to be talking to you about the, the 96 Boards developer box a little bit. Um, that's a, a, a box you can buy. It was one of the first, quotes affordable ARM64 PC-like systems. I say affordable in air quotes because it's still four figures, um, but that's still a good deal cheaper than many of other boxes in the field. We'll talk very briefly about Opti, which is a um, operating system to run inside the trust zone on an ARM system. Uh, but mostly we'll talk about randomness, which is a, a, the degree to which something is unpredictable, um, and entropy, which is a measure of how random something actually is. Um, so I don't want to advertise the developer box, but I do have to explain to you a little bit about it. Um, if you want me to advertise it, come and speak to me in the hall afterwards, or search for my name and developer box with no space, and you'll see a whole bunch of YouTube videos. Um, okay, so like I say, it's a 64-bit ARM computer in a PC form factor. Um, and if you can see in the picture on the side, one of the things that makes it most awesome is all those RAM slots. So it's one of the quotes, affordable ARM machines to which we can put enough RAM in it to do compiling and things like that. Um, it's based on this rather obscure um, Synquasa processor from Sosinex. Um, I added this this morning after this morning's talk. Uh, I believe that um, it has fully free software running on the main cores. So the trusted firmware, EDK2, Opti, are all user replaceable uh, and are all open source and upstreamed. Um, in the case of EDK2, we also ship a non-upstream but fully open source driver as well to get graphics cards to work. Um, I've mentioned main cores explicitly. There is a sort of front panel microcontroller which is in charge of programming the DDR and which we haven't got the source available yet. We are working on that. Um, the reason I'm talking to you today is because it does not have any hardware random number generator built into the hardware, um, but it does have a number of on-chip thermal sensors. And so the essence and question of the talk is, can you make an RNG from those thermal sensors, and why go to the trouble of doing it in the first place? So um, going to the trouble, I'll explain why we're doing it first. Um, so ultimately, access to high-quality random numbers is foundational to a number of practical cryptographic and security use cases. Um, it's fundamental to secure, secure sockets. It's a famous problem with some microcontroller implementations that they send you a predictable number to start every TLS transaction. And if they do that, then you can watch every TLS transaction that, that microcontroller takes part in. Um, fundamentally, if you do anything with GPG, you need good quality randomness to generate keys. Um, I wouldn't use this random generator on its own to generate my GPG key, but I would allow it to contribute to the pool. Um, it's also used for security features like address space layout randomization, um, which is simply a probabilistic defense to make sure two computers look different when somebody breaks into them. Um, the, the kernel, Linux kernel, does include a fairly decent um, random number generator based on mostly on measuring into interrupt timings and keyboard timings and other unpredictable events. Um, the reason we wanted to go that little bit further and add some hardware support is that it lacks entropy during critical moments in the system, especially in boot. There's some rather famous problems with uh, routers that come up and don't have access to randomness until after they've booted and therefore they can't... Um, layout randomization, et cetera. Um, systems that are headless, so they don't have keyboards, they don't have human users, particularly if they're very quiet or unpredictable networks, don't get any interesting interrupt timings that they want to look at. And if you care about these things, if you are writing a secure component to protect your system, um, then it won't trust the Linux random number generator because it's sitting in a, a space with a, a higher degree of protection. Uh, my personal interest was I wanted to play with open source TPMs. So this board does not have a TPM, but there is a plug-in TPM module, and I didn't really want to take the plug-in TPM module. I wanted to try and play with soft versions of it. Um, so I wanted to get an open source TPM running in Secure World. We haven't got anywhere near that point yet, uh, and whether I get time to do it is a 
very much an open question. Um, but that was my personal interest, and therefore the, one of the first things that you need to have uh, a TPM implementation is something to give you random number numbers that the TPM trusts. Uh, so we started with the random number generator. Um, there was actually another reason. Uh, from this point onwards, the talk will be in time order, but I've actually presented things in a slightly backwards order. So um, this is the state of the developer box when we got to, to start working on it. We had all our open source operating system running normal world. There was nothing in secure world. Uh, and we were asked to do an OptiPort to it. So we started doing the OptiPort, we finished the OptiPort, and we thought, right, how can we demonstrate that the OptiPort is doing something useful? <laughs> and that's when we discovered that there was a thermal sensor that is only ever readable by software running in the secure world. Uh, a brief introduction to ARM Trust Zone. Roughly speaking, think of it as two register sets for the machine. And um, when you need to do certain security operations, the whole of the register sets will flip over and you'll be running this secure, it's almost like a virtual machine, but it's implemented in the hardware. Um, and that virtual machine asserts on the bus that it's secure which means the bus is able to prevent accesses to certain parts of the chip. Um, the developer box is more or less an open system, um, so the behaviours of those um, uh, secure enclaves and things like that can be reasonably well controlled, although that micro that I mentioned at the first place does set them up. It's then unable to change them after the fact. Um, so we wanted to put something in the secure world so that when we go onto the bus to read our thermal sensor, we get the bit set to say, I'm a secure access. Um, and that's how you do it, basically. This is, this is Opti that you have to plug in. Um, Opti is an open source, trusted execution environment. Um, and this is the thing we had to, to implement. Um, and roughly speaking, yes, so you can see we've got a trusted app. It knows how to read the thermal sensor. It then uh, copies that back into its own internal state. You have to use these secure monitor calls. That's what SMC at the bottom stands for. Eventually, you can then get the sensor reading into the kernel. And in the case of our work, because we'd like to get up to all the kernel hardware random number generator infrastructure, um, we actually keep it in the kernel. We don't need those user space components to go and interact with our, our trusted application. Um, the theory of the randomness we're reading, just a very, this is the final sort of introductory part, at least I think it is. Um, <laughs> so we needed some randomness, and we did not know at the start of this project whether or not we had access to any randomness. The resolution of the temperature sensor is pretty coarse. It is a quarter of a degree. So you won't actually see thermal noise. It's not like the temperature of the core will be rocketing up and down. Um, and even if it did, it would be relatively predictable. Um, so what you basically have is measurement error on the ADC. And I've drawn this as a, a graph. The dotted line is supposed to represent the actual temperature of the system. I couldn't get it curved when I was tidying up the graph yesterday, so pretend it's curved. Uh, and then you've got these samples, which are what the ADC actually observes relative to the real sensor. Uh, and you can use that small difference, uh, which if, even if you're reading a constant value, you should see move a little bit. Um, and that's caused it's partly by measurement error, but I believe that on this system, what you're actually observing is ADC conversion error. And what happens is when you're doing an analog to digital conversion, you have a voltage reference. And it's, I suspect there is noise on the voltage reference, and so the noise that we observe on the thermal sensor is actually the supply voltage uh, fluctuating up and down locally within the SOC. So it will have a whole bunch of decoupling capacitors. Each of the cores will be connected to different capacitors. So as they consume and, and release, you know, as they consume power, you'll see noise start to emerge on the bus. They all interact in, let's hope, unpredictable ways. We believe it's unpredictable. Uh, and that's where the source of our entropy ultimately comes from. Um, so we didn't know it was going to be random when we started, so we gathered a chunk of raw, raw data and we eyeballed it. And um, we thought, yeah, we're not doing much. We've on a quiescent system. We're still seeing some oscillation in the bottom bits, which I've highlighted for you. Um, the oscillation goes right up to bit, what is it, bit five, but you can see that most of the noise in the upper bits is just sine flips. You know, when you cross over, you've got the carries whizzing up. So all the noise, in the certainly in the... Uh, top five bits is all just carry noise. Uh, I think there's a little bit of entropy happening in bit one, um, but we can certainly see the oscillations in bit zero, even when we're keeping the system fairly quiescent. So that was enough for us to start exploring. We've done enough now to start trying to decide if we can gather entropy out of this system. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, the other thing you'll notice, sample number, I can only get a sample out of the thermal sensor every two milliseconds which is glacially slow. Um, and if you've only got 
noise in that bottom bit, uh, then your data rate will be one bit every two milliseconds, which I think is 125 bytes a second, um, which isn't very impressive. It's not. It's enough to be useful, actually, um, because you can start storing it up until you need it. But um, we are very fortunate that I was actually misleading you earlier. There are seven temperature sensors. There is one sensor for each cluster, and there's a dye sensor. Like I say, we can be fairly sure that the cluster power supplies are being decoupled independently, so they're probably giving us different noise each time we read them. We're certainly making that assumption. Um, so we've actually got, it's still only in the order of a k a second, but we have at least got some decent uh, data rate. Um, so that gives us our random number generating me mechanism. We've got these seven sensors at the bottom. We collect some randomness from the bottom bits, and we have a random byte stream. So I've got a random. So that, that was all a walk in the park, right? So porting a new operating system to a new platform. Um, we've done all these things. It, it only took some about three weeks, I think, to get all that up. And now is where the work actually starts, <laughs> because we've got a number, 42. Is it random? This is a deeply misleading question because I haven't told you how many bits that number occupies. If it was a seven-bit number, yeah, maybe. If it's a 64-bit number, you've got so many leading zeros, 32 bits is getting up to four billion. If you've got that many leading zeros, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, for anybody who's read the Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy, um, you'll recognize that this isn't a random number, or not, not very random anyway. Uh, according to Douglas Adams, he looked at the, he, he was trying to decide he needed a smallish number, looked out the window and thought 42. Um, but humans are notoriously bad at selecting random numbers, so we can't call that one a random number. How about this one? This is a 40-bit number. Is it random? You don't have to answer. Um, because this is the number 42 repeated five times. <laughs> I like 42. Um, 42 has this nice property in terms of disguising it is random noise because it, it composed of 32 plus 8 plus 2 which gives us lots of nice oscillating bits, which means you can, for a short period, mislead a human. The reason I picked 40 bits is because if I'd made it any longer, you'd have seen those big drifts of three zeros drift across my slide. So I had to abridge it there to try and hide the fact it's not random. Um, but anyway, so the probability of getting that specific 40-bit number is, uh, roughly speaking, one trillion to one against. But it's falling, because if you didn't know I was going to pick the number 42, because I showed it to you in the previous slide, you now have to check every one of the 8-bit numbers to see if I've replicated it in every slot, which means we're now down when we see a number and say, is it random? That's down to 4 billion. Um, there's only seven temperature sensors, so why would it replicate every 8 bits? Who knows? So we've actually got to start. This is where my maths can't, I can't calculate the probabilities for you anymore. But um, when you start looking at all the different possible patterns, obviously every 40-bit number has a 1 in trillion chance of occurring. So in terms of saying this one's random and this one isn't, you've still got absolutely no real hope with the 40-bit 40 40 bit number, assuming it wasn't all zeros, of saying uh, this number isn't random, what you're thinking about. So um, in the real world, most of the tests start to run in the order of 20,000 bits. Um, and if anybody cares, um, the odds of every single uh, byte in that 20,000-bit stream all being 42 is a number that 6,000 digits one long to one against. I'm not going to read the number out. I couldn't even fit it on the slide. Um, but I have done a visualization for you. This is 20,000 bits of entropy. Um, and to give you some idea of what it looks like, and I'm also going to show you 20,000 bits of entropy. Um, it's the same size, it's the same shape, um, and the thing I want you to keep in mind is that the amount of entropy in both of those images is exactly the same despite one looking substantially more complex than the other, um, the only difference between them is that one was scaled using the slide program I used, and that was scaled by hand to give you pixelization. But they are actually exactly the same image, and for that reason, and the fact they've had a predictable transformation applied to them, they have exactly the same amount of information in them, I if you study the kind of information theory, other than the fact that you don't know what scaling algorithm I use, which adds maybe a couple of bits of information. but. Uh, beyond that point, um, those two items have exactly the same amount of entropy in them. But one does look, to the naked eye, much more complicated. And I'd just like you to bury that thought for a few minutes, because I'll come back to it in a few slides' time. OK, so we've got our 20,000 bits. Um, random number generator does provoke a strong degree of paranoia, because the very nature of random number theory means that you can never 
know if a number is genuinely random because if I keep flipping a chalk coin for the next 10 years, it could come up tails every time. So if you show me a number that says all zeros, you don't know it's not random, you just know that it's quite improbable. And so eventually you have to let your paranoia go a bit and decide where you're going to draw the line. Um, so for our initial test, test of testing, we decided to follow, um, well, we <laughs> I say we decided to follow, we found the tool in the Linux random number generator suite called RNG test and decided to use it as our first tool to analyze our numbers. Um, that particular tool is based on FIPS 140-2, which is a security standard from the US. Um, and we collected, like I say, about two gigs of raw data. We processed it a little bit, and then we ran our candidate algorithms against this to see how they performed. So algorithm number one. Uh, we took the bottom bits and the bottom bits alone. Um, so what that means is we have to wait four milliseconds to be able to compose our first byte because we need that G0 prime to get the last byte. And we ran it through the tests. And it showed that only about 2% of the time was our batch of 20,000 bits random. 2%. And I was over the moon about that because what that means is that although the numbers are unquestionably biased, they're not very biased. And that means that all our, it's really hard to estimate entropy and figure out how much entropy there is a bit. So that means that all our guesstimates about those low order bits and saying they look like they're moving, finger in the air, um, that means that that's probably right. We are seeing some movement. And if we were able to tidy things up a bit, um, we could potentially uh, improve our score there. Um, so we came up with a second algorithm. We didn't expect this one to be an improvement, but we wanted to figure out how much entropy there is in the second bit, the one that I mentioned you can see moving a bit at the beginning. Uh, and we, so we XORed them all together. We figured they would get a little bit of carry propagation noise from the other bits, um, but if we XORed them together, we ought to get a whole bit of entropy, and that'd be really awesome. Uh, and we got 0.07%. So um, I still don't know, even talking to you now, how much entropy there is in that first bit, but there's certainly a very pronounced bias, even when you XOR them all together, and that pronounced bias causes the FIPS test to fail almost continually. Um, so we wanted to get better than 2%, so we started looking at conditioning algorithm algorithms, and um, one of the things I looked at was the NUC random number generator token and some of its early implementations, um, and it mentioned CRC. Now, CRC as an algorithm has this tremendous bit mixing effect just because of the way it works by picking these bits together and trying to generate the redundancy check, um, it, it has this tremendous effect of mixing entropy and all the bits together, which you can view as saying, I'm taking the entropy in this and I'm trying to spread the entropy among 32 bits and then give them back to you. So we tried doing that. We tried to spread the entropy among those bits. Um, we tried it with four byte payloads, five byte payloads, just to see what happened. Um, and in both cases, we got 99.9% .9 success ratio. Even though one was actually mixing in more entropy than the other, they were still giving us the same success ratio, which is a bit odd, we thought. So at that point, we, we, we decided to go back and read a bit more theory. In fact, we didn't really read the theory. We went to experiment. Uh, we went to random.org. They have, I think it's a bunch of weather, weather sensors that give them a fairly low rate random number generator. But they are courteous enough to store the last 10 years of random number generators that they've generated with this weather information. Um, it's as close as we can get to, it was certainly the best we could find for getting um, unbiased, non-Intel uh, random number stream. <laughs> um, so we took that, we ran the tests, 99.9%. .9%. Now I think this is essentially engineering. Um, so what I think is happening is the FIPS tests are almost certainly designed so that the failure rate is tolerable, but high enough to be useful. And I think what they've said is we would like random number numbers, genuinely random streams, to pass the test 99.9% .9 of the time and we'll just be okay for discarding that small amount of entropy every so often when we get that bad, unlucky case. Um, you can see it's usually either the monobit test is quite fun. Monobit basically means we've got too many ones or too many zeros, um, and there's a threshold of how many you get. Um, I can't remember how the poker test works. Runs calculates the length of different runs and effectively is trying to work out the probability of bit flips. A continuous run is very simple. If you get, I think it's 12 bits, it fails. <laughs> 12 bits all the same is sufficient to be failure. Um, so, those tests, I believe, have been engineered to give you a specific failure rate with genuine random data, and we've met it. So with our conditioning, um, we've now met the same threshold that true random data has. And just as a quick aside, um, there's a lot of controversy about Intel's random number generators. 
but we were the reason <laughs> this is actually what we ran first. The first thing we did was we just fired up a couple of hardware random number generators on the machines available to us. That's Summit's machine. He had an Intel, I had an AMD. We gathered them up and we did some quick tests. It was after that we went to random.org. But just as an aside, we saw with the, the hardware generators on the x86 machines, they were giving us the same ratio. Still no proof it's random. There's lots and lots of ways to generate information that's 99.9% .9 FIPS pass. Every single cryptographically secure random number generator in the world is designed to pass tests like that. So the fact it does it doesn't really tell as much, but it was one of the data points we used to see what was going on. So we've got our algorithm. We're getting 99.9% .9 success ratio. Regrettably, it is not all rainbows and unicorns um, because we can't discriminate between the two algorithms I presented you a second ago. I said that one had more entropy than the other. Uh, it's not just that one has more entropy than the other. We know one of them is broken. I'll show you why in a moment. Um, and we tried to use more aggressive tests just to discriminate between these two levels of randomness, and we couldn't do it. We couldn't. Die Harder basically needs so much entropy, and it's a relatively so slow sensor, that we couldn't run enough Die Harder rounds <laughs> to see any difference with any degree of certainty that something bad's happening. Um, OK, so the CRC algorithms. Um, on the left-hand side, the one with the unicorn, um, it's saying it's taking a four-byte payload, four bytes, 32 bits, and we're producing a 32-bit output. So we've taken a biased 32-bit number generated from our XOR bit one algorithm, and we've put it through CRC. It's not possible for that to add any entropy. For the same reason that image I showed you before, where it's swift clicking between the scaling algorithms, all that's happening is the CRC is, I mean, it's not going to be doing a scale, but it's manipulating the perception that the tests have. Um, and it's still enough to pass the FIPS test 99.9% .9 of the time. The one on the right is not necessarily mathematically broken, um, but it's still using CRC, and CRC makes people with strong security uh, training very uncomfortable. Very, very uncomfortable indeed, as we discovered when we tried to submit this upstream. Um, so, there are some problems with the system as it stands. Uh, the first is that we don't know how much entropy there is per sensor reading, and I'm still standing in front of you not entirely sure of that fact. Ent estimating entropy is hard. Um, most algorithms overestimate um, if the data doesn't conform to certain statistical properties, meaning independent and identically distributed. And a sensor reading, which hovers around a particular value, is never going to be independent uh, because the previous value is very likely to predict the next value. Um, and similarly, it's unlikely to be identically distributed all the time because as the temperature changes, the behavior of the, temp the temperature sensor changes with it. It's, it's inevitable. Sometimes it'll be in the middle of a uh, bit band, and sometimes it'll be by the edge of a bit band. And when it's by the edge, you'll get more noise than when it's in the middle. Um, like I say, CRC does upset security engineers. Um, it's not actually banned. You can have um, trustworthy entropy sources that are using CRC within them. Um, but the various, certainly the American NIST standards, which are one of the best, most readable documents in this space, um, essentially punish unvetted algorithms by multiplying the entropy estimate by 0.85. So you can never get a full bit per byte of, a uh, full eight bits per byte of entropy if you've gone through CRC32 conditioning. There's also some busy waiting in there, but looking at my watch, I think we're probably not going to be talking about that much today. I have designed the talks so I can abort for the last four or five slides. So if I skip through five at once, that's why. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I will mention it a bit. So, um, actually, how am I doing for time? I started, I've got 20 minutes, 10 minutes left. I will talk about the, the busy wait, sorry. <laughs> so, we've got busy waiting. The reason we've got busy waiting is to do with the way we enter and leave the secure zone, the, the trust zone. Um, essentially, it's because Opti doesn't offer a normal threading system. I've called it an operating system. It is. It's SMP safe. It supports interrupts, but it doesn't allow you to kick off threads. So we couldn't just kick off a thread and get it to read the temperature sensor every two milliseconds um, and then store it in a big pool somewhere and then splurge it all back to Linux in one shot. Um, so the early algorithms we had when Linux asked for four bytes of, uh, for, sorry, for 4K of entropy for test purposes, we just left it spinning, waiting for several seconds, occupying the CPU until we got it back. Um, which does kind of suck in a real system. Even with 24 cores, you can't really send one of them off into the weeds for, for seconds at a time. Um, so we had to come up with a way to kind of hoard the entropy ahead of time and at least allow us to return to Linux uh, and let Linux do something useful while we go to accumulate entropy. 
So the way this stuff looks is we've got the normal world on the left, secure world on the right. We've got what's called a pseudo trusted application. That's just opti terminology for the type of application we've written. Um, and ultimately, it's a, it's a very low tech. All we have to do is set up a timer interrupt. Um, this is not entirely trivial because there's not a lot of prior art in Opti for interrupt management. It has interrupt support, but very few of the upstream platforms actually take advantage of it. So one of the other nice things we wanted to have in this wor work is that because we are fortunate that we are allowed to be open, there are no limits on the developer box uh, that require us to keep any secrets from anybody, um, we can push our work out as reference um, to show how secure interrupts can be done. Um, so essentially, we are literally doing interrupt every two milliseconds. We're gathering data off the sensors, and we're throwing it into the entropy pool. Um, but the key thing is that because we know the data rate, and we can tell Linux what the data rate is, we can have a generic kind of secure world random number generator Linux driver that asks for n bytes, gets told it's got to wait, but it also knows. So we basically use Linux read semantics, where you give back everything we've got. And the driver can then work out what the data rate is, how long it needs before it needs to wake up and go and ask us again for the rest of its data. Um, so that at least means that we're not doing real-time hard for the system. The, the Linux system is not inconvenienced by having to go into the firmware to get um, a random number. And then finally, we're going to kind of assemble the, the various use cases we've got set up. So this is feeding the Linux kernels um, cryptographically secure pseudo random number generators. These are the things that use inter interrupt timing uh, as one of the sources of their entropy. Um, so the pseudo TA is gathering the entropy via SMC. It is passing it over to the TEE driver in the Linux operating system, which then has the hardware random number generator driver that grabs those stuffs and just hands them up to the random number generator daemon that runs in user space. The random number generator daemon will then run those FIPS 140 tests that I mentioned before and will then inject the resulting entropy after it's gone through approval into the kernel. Um, it might surprise people to see all this lovely entropy that you've got to keep confidential. Uh, unpredictability and confidentiality are kind of linked. So if you imagine playing Risk, which is a game you play with dice, if you threw dice 20,000 times at the beginning of the game and wrote down in a little book what order they came up, that would have all the nice statistical properties of randomness, but it would make playing Risk really dull because you'd both look at the dice ahead of time before you decide whether to attack somebody. Um, so randomness, the confidentiality of random numbers is its not part of being random, but it's very important to the practical use of randomness, and the risk example kind of shows you why. If, if you know what somebody's going to pick, even if it was randomly generated, it's still, you know what they're going to pick, you can break into their crypto system if you know what they're going to pick. So. Um, it might kind of surprise see you, you, you people to find this kind of confidential stream of random numbers going into user space and then coming back into the kernel. Um, and ultimately, the reason for that is that if the hardware random number generator driver is not prepared to say, I meet this specification for the number of bits per byte of entropy, then you just send it to the kernel, it gets tested, and when it, sorry, you send it to user space, and when it comes back, the kernel only half trusts it. <laughs> In other words, when it stirs that new random information into the entry pool, um, it doesn't allow that to be the only source of randomness in the pool. And this is what I say when I would be prepared to use a system based on this work to generate my own. I mean, my, gen my GPG keys were generated years ago. But if I were generating new ones, I probably would be prepared to use this system um, personally because I know that I'm combining unpredictable interim timings, my keyboard timings, my, my local network, and the entropy off these sensors all into one kind of soup. Um, and there's a lot to be said for, for having multiple reasons, not multiple places you take your randomness from. It's just, it's just a, a good practice, partly because the other thing you'll find in all security standards is that random number generators are fragile. Uh, because they're relying on some peculiar physical property, maybe you get a different board and the power supplies are more stable or there's less capacitance or they change the board thickness and there's now less capacitance between the power rails on the board. Maybe some of that oscillation we see is variance in the decoupling capacitors. Um, you know, di different board-to-board -board instances may behave differently. So people consider the actual hardware that generates randomness to be quite fragile. And because it's fragile, redundant copies, extra bits, it's all very valuable. Um, at boot time, it's very similar in some ways. We've got the pseudo TA still all there in the secure world. We talk to it from the system firmware, which is implementing ADK2. ADK um, it can do this SMC, get the data, 
it won't go into any cryptographically support randomness. It will simply give that randomness directly to the kernel so that it can set up its address-based layout randomization. Is that enough? Yeah, it's debatable. But ultimately, address-based layout randomization is a 10-bit defense. You are talking about 1,000 possible options that you can place your kernel at. And the idea is that is that when somebody's trying to crack into a computer, um, you know, they've got a 1 in 1,000 chance of knowing where the kernel is unless you leak it. So when you've only got 10 bits of, of entropy anyway, you know, it's better to give it some um, than to go through the whole interim to up timing that you can't do in a bootloader because you haven't set up the keyboard yet. OK, so wrapping up with our next steps. Um, like I say, our ambition is to upstream it. When we attempted to upstream it, our security team, they didn't laugh at us. They were very kind. Um, but at the same time, they didn't want to take it in the condition that we offered it. Um, so first thing, um, we don't have access to a tremendous number of physical samples, um, partly because they're all four figures expensive and my garage is finite in capacity. Um, so we could start trying to characterize all the randomness. You, you can, you can, NIST does display a kind of arsenal of tests you can do to guess how much entropy there is in the system. Uh, and then it kind of conservatively processes it so your guess is supposed to be at the bottom end rather than the top end of the estimate. You know, when your estimation has a degree of accuracy, they've geared everything so that the estimation you get is, is very conservative. Um, but with the lack of samples and other things, and the amount of effort involved to do it, um, we don't think we'll be able to go through that anytime soon. Um, so what I think we're planning to do is we're going to pick a, f a like I say, a f what we think is a very conservative estimate, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.5 bytes, bits per sample. So every single sensor when we read it, we're going to we're, we're assume something like 0 0.5, which we, we believe from everything we've learned so far is a reasonable and conservative estimate, but it is a wet finger in the air. We'll document that. If somebody else wants to do the work, it's open source. They're very welcome to do so. Um, but like I say, we, we believe that's a, a sane estimate. Um, and also, because we haven't got access to the, the wide variety of samples, it means we can design health tests to give us confidence that even on different physical samples, we're getting that 0 0.5 bits. Um, so that's one of the key is aspects, is by, by, by picking what we think is the entropy, we can then devise health tests and engineer the probabilities of those health tests failing, so that if you're way outside that, the health tests will start to fail and the system will raise a flag and say, I can't give you any, any random numbers. Um, and all those health tests will happen before conditioning. So the idea is that will happen in the secure world before we do any conditioning. Um, we'll also switch to a vetted algorithm, which means that after we've condensed the data down by about four times, you saw the original CRC algorithm was a one-to-one -one conversion, which is always mathematically broken. Um, you can also pass it through that CRC, which was five bytes to four bytes. That's not mathematically broken, but it's not conservative enough for security guys. Um, so the vetted algorithms halve the data rate going in. So, so you have to have twice as much entropy going in to the claimed entropy coming out again. Um, and of course, because we're only assuming half a bit per byte, that's the other. So it's two, we halve the data rate by going to half a bit per byte. We halve the data rate by going through the conditioner. But that gives an entropy at a, a full spectrum, a full eight bits per byte of entropy in the resulting output, which is a nice property to have. Um, and like I say, we're confident that those estimates are, if not perfect, certainly enough that you should not be terribly worried about your future. Um, and then finally, upstreaming, upstreaming, upstreaming. We want to get this into Opti so that people can use it as a reference. Uh, we want to get the random hardware random generator that reads from it into Linux. We want to get the address space layout randomization hooked up to it in EDK2. Uh, so that's the next step for us. And I, like I say, we're not experts in random numbers. We have become dramatically more expert over the course of the last few months. Um, but like I say, it's, it's a complex area of mathematics. People have built careers out of studying the statistics of random numbers, trying to devise ever more complicated randomness tests. Um, but we're just kind of jobbing engineers. So that's what we came up with so far. And Thanks to me not being the first speaker, I even remembered to put IRC, IRC channel on that. I'm terribly sorry. I did actually forget to put the IRC channel on until I came to the conference today. Um, but yes, if somebody wants to talk about random numbers or the developer box, Opti does have a different channel, but I can point you to it if you, if you need um, on 96 boards. So um, I am to time, but if somebody 